So this video is about the build of this little clock that I've uh, got from Banggood. Uh, if you need to find this clock on Banggood, just search for clock and Bluetooth and you should be able to find it. It's quite an interesting little project. There's quite a lot going on. For a start, you've got the seconds displayed on the outside on 60 LEDs, so there's multiplexing there and the actual time is displayed on a four seven segment LED displays in the middle. You've also got a temperature sensor which will uh, display on the screen and more importantly on the back you have a little Bluetooth module so it will actually connect to an Android phone and then you can then synchronize the time to your phone or you can set alarms or do hourly reminders and so on. So it's quite a nice little project. It's not for beginners because it's surface mount, but it is quite an interesting project. Um, again, if you want to buy this, you can get it from Banggood for about 16 US dollars. Just search for Bluetooth and clock. So before I start this build, I'm just going to point out a few things. Uh, you may have noticed this uh, kit is made up with a lot of surface mount components. So it's definitely not for beginners. Um, if you haven't used or tried surface mount components before, then you really want to uh, practice first before starting a kit. Uh, second thing to support that is that uh, most of the components you have, you do have spares. So the 10k resistor, there's 20 there, you actually only need 18 so you get a couple of chances to uh, drop one on the floor or mess up. Um, also I wouldn't bother attempting surface mount unless you've got a few bits of equipment. The first thing that I find essential is solder and importantly this is 0 0.7 millimeter solder, very fine solder. Next thing Soldering iron has got a very fine tip on it, as you can see that. Um, you can get a needle tip which is finer, but this one is quite good. The other thing I need is an eyeglass, because I cannot see these. So that's another important bit, and I've also got this light here to illuminate the whole thing. You don't get any instructions with this kit, but you can download the full instructions and a circuit diagram and quite useful is a parts listing as well. Uh, so I've downloaded those and printed those out. I haven't printed out the full instructions but I am going to follow them and make sure they read correctly. Um, it's not a too bad translation and I can follow them quite easily. First thing we're going to start with is the surface mount components. So I'm going to move the camera so you can get a closer look of how I do that. Um, it's also worth noting that the surface mount components are mounted on both sides of the PCB. So the first step of this build is the surface mount components. What I've done is uh, taped the board down to a piece of paper and then the paper is taped to the desk so it doesn't move. And I'm going to start at this point and work along. As I've said, I'm using very small solder and I'm only going to do one component at a time. How I like to do this is I like to put a blob of solder on one pad of each component and then place the component in, in the place, hold it down with this wooden stick and then heat the solder up again. So I'm just going to demonstrate that with the first few components so you can see what I'm doing. So R6 is our first resistor and as my component list shows me that is a 10k so that is over here. So first thing I do is drop it on the board, get it facing the right way, slide it in position 
I'm using a wooden stick because uh, I've discovered in the past that if you use a metal one you end up finding it's magnetic. Let's put it in place very carefully hold it down and while you're holding it down just melt that. Now it went a bit skew if but it's still on the pad. Can I straighten it without messing it up? A bit, yep. Once it's on, just do the other pad. And that is one resistor. Uh, with the eyepiece I can then check whether that is correct. That well, doesn't look too bad. So I've done the first few components down here and I'm now just going to go and do this next 1K so you can see the process again. You might have noticed I've got a wooden skewer here which is what I prefer to use because then uh, don't run that risk of whatever you are uh, having being magnetic. And then the next one we've got is a transistor, I've already placed it there. These are very small items and these are very fiddly to get in line. So you've got to get it nicely in line. When you're happy you then got to very carefully hold it and then just touch that leg. There it goes. If you, uh, don't get one of these items right first time, just let it cool down before you attack it again. There you go. Now I'm going to finish off this and go to the next stage. So just before I carry on, I'm just going to point out the resistors here. You've got R15 I've just done. That is a 47 ohm resistor and that has a marking of 470, 47 with 0 noughts on, so 47 ohms. The next one along, R18, is a 10K, so that will have a marking of 103 or 10 with 3 zeros, 10K. Uh, the same pattern follows the sequence along, so you need to be very careful that you get the right resistors in the right place because if you swap either one around you're going to get strange results. Just as a little example of how I'm doing this and uh, the risks you might have is uh, for each component I'm taking the strip and I'm pulling it back one at a time, the outer covering, then dropping it onto the board. But what you can find is it will disappear uh, and here it is, it's turned upside down. So you can't see it, and it's actually quite hard to turn it the other way. There it is. So do one at a time, and don't rush things. Hmm. <laughs> really does help having this on a bit of paper so if you do flick it as I just did you can find it. So I've finished doing this line all the way down here that was uh, quite a challenge and now I've got the remaining ones here, here, here and then around here so I'm going to start over here then go down there start here go this way and then do these three try to avoid working over yourself because there's a chance you might accidentally put the soldering iron on a pad and pick it off the PCB without you even knowing it. And you'll look later and you go, where is it? And find it in the sponge. Okay, so I've finished all the surface mount components and I just wanted to point out the capacitors. Here you can see C3 and C4 and they form the uh, part of the crystal circuit. And here you see C2. 
Um, it's important to note that these are two vastly different values. Um, these pair are marked as 20p on the packaging and this one is marked as 104 which is a code which I believe relates to 100 nanofarads. So it's important you get the right values in the right place and there's no indication of the value on the capacitor. If you get the wrong value in the uh, place here you'll probably find it um, the crystal won't oscillate. I'm following the sequence of instructions and the uh, next stage is to install the two crystals. Uh, the main one here and the one for the uh, real-time clock here. Uh, this one's easy, just shove it in and solder. But this one you want to be slightly careful because there's a little solder pad at the end here and you want to make sure you solder it in so you can put a blob of solder on the end just to retain it. So don't put it in sharp, you want a little bend slightly further along. So I'm now going to do those. And then next is all the LEDs. So I'm just putting the LEDs down on the board. As you can see the red ones mark out the cardinal points and the four spaces in between are the yellow ones. Because these are LEDs you need to make sure you put them the right way around. You can see there's a little plus indication. The plus is for the anode which also relates to the long leg. If you happen to cut the legs off um, then there is another indication. The negative side also goes to this flat on the side here. So all the flat should be on the inside and all the long legs should be on the outside. Right, I've placed all the LEDs in the PCB and I've turned the board over and you should be able to see that all the long legs are on the outside. The instructions tell you to solder one leg at a time and I would agree that's a good thing to do because if one's gone out of place you can just move it by uh, melting the solder on the one leg. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go around all the outside legs with the soldering iron. Uh, with LEDs try to solder quickly as excessive heat can damage LEDs and then you're going to have to replace it. I've quickly soldered all the outer legs and just check that everything looks okay and none are sitting proud and none are out of place and if you're happy then you can just solder all the inside ones which is what I will do now. Next to be soldered is the temperature sensor. You can see I've put it in place here. I've left it extended off the board a little way. You don't want it too close to the board. You want it to detect true temperature. And obviously you have to uh, put it in the correct way. You can see the flat goes to the flat on the uh, image on the board. After this you've then got the uh, buttons, the chip holders, and the battery holder. I'm just going to go through those very quickly. So I've soldered the three buttons in place. I just thought it's worth pointing out that they're put on this side of the PCB. You probably could have put them on the other side, but it should be obvious which side you put it on. The next component to go on is the eight pin chip holder, and you should try to get this notch aligned correctly with a notch on the uh, graphic. Same with the, uh, I'm guessing that's 40 pin one. So I'll do those ones now. I'm now doing the main chip. Pins down here, down here. There's a couple of things worth noting. When you're doing these pins here, you're very close to this surface mount component. You don't want to accidentally take that off. And as you approach the end of the row, you need to be careful that you're not accidentally going to melt melt these diodes here with the soldering iron as you get to the end of the row. So it's probably best to do a certain number then turn the board around. Okay. 
I'm doing quite well at the moment. I sorted most of the components. The next component to go in is the battery holder for the real time clock. And there's a point to make here. As you solder on the back here, this point here will end up underneath the display. So it suggests you cut it flush. My suggestion would you just bend it over and solder it. Hopefully you should be able to see the uh, leg of the uh, battery holder bent over there. I've soldered it in place and hopefully the display should fit over it nicely. Which it does. The other pin here isn't in the way so you don't have to worry about that one. While we're talking about the uh, display fit, it also suggests in the instructions that you need to trim these pins, but I have found that not to be necessary. In fact, the next component to be soldered in place is a display. And as I place that in, it's important to note that the four decimal places here point towards the bottom here. Otherwise it will not work. And again, when you solder the legs, you need to be very careful of all these surface mounts here. And you could melt the battery holder. So just take your time and make sure you're not going to touch any of these components. Next we're going to solder the header, there's uh, six pins here. So I've put it in place and what I'm going to do is hold it in place with one finger, making sure it's at the other end to which I'm soldering. I'm going to solder the first pin. Make sure it's level, which it's not, but that's no problem because I can just hold it and level it off. And once I'm happy with it, so do the other pins. Next to solder is this header. In my instructions it says don't solder, but because this is a Bluetooth version, I'm going to connect the Bluetooth to this connector. So again, I've just placed it in, and I'll solder one pin on the other side first, check the alignment, and if it's okay, solder the others. We're now on the last three components. The item I'm holding is the buzzer and it's worth pointing out this has a positive lead so make sure you get that on the correct pin there. The capacitor is also electrolytic so that has a negative leg so again make sure that's in the right place and you shouldn't really be able to solder the USB connector on the wrong way around. I guess you could solder it onto the wrong side of the board but it must be soldered onto this side of the board in the correct order. So they're the last ones I'm going to do. Okay, so everything is now soldered into place. And the last job to do is to uh, install the two chips. Uh, it's very important you get these the correct way around. Here you can see the little cutout there aligns with the cutout on the PC board and the chip holder. I've had to bend the pins in slightly to get it to fit nicely. But you should find that will push down. When you push down these chips, just have a look down here and make sure no legs are hanging out of the chip holder on both sides. The real-time clock chip has the uh, cutout going the other way, so that lines up here. Just bend the, pin, the legs in a bit, and that should just slot in. And there you have it, a completed real-time clock.
Next we've got to put some power on and see what happens. Okay, so I've finished the clock. I think it's taken me about three hours to put together. Now the uh, big question, does it work? So at first look, everything looks okay until you realise there's a digit missing on the seven segment display. Um, and it's useful to have a look at the wiring diagram and it makes a bit more sense to where to start fault finding. The key thing is to look at what is working and it would appear from the seconds rotating around the board that all of these are working. Um, and it's only this segment that's not working. So knowing that, we need to have a look at the board a bit closer. Just going to unplug it. When I was soldering the components, you may remember that there are a certain amount of transistors on this side and so on the other side here. Well, more importantly, on the back here, have that focus. More importantly, back here, there are four transistors and eight associated resistors to do the four segments here. So knowing that, you know the fault's going to lie within this section here. And what I've done is have a closer look. And if I zoom in, at that focus, you may notice I've missed a resistor there. So hopefully I'll just replace that resistor and everything should work. So there you have it, everything seems to be working. So I'm still playing with this real-time clock. Um, worked out a few things. I haven't got the Bluetooth connected yet, but what I've found if you press reset, it goes off and then press and hold either one of the other buttons, it enters a seconds pattern mode. Here you can see it's flashing zero, and that is the default pattern. If I press plus, changes the type of pattern. Oh, didn't do it quick enough. So there we go, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and back to 0. At any time you press mode to return to the time. When you're in normal display if you press plus you get a temperature readout and then mode takes you back to the time. So this is going to be the last part of the video. I didn't know how hard or easy the Bluetooth part was going to be so I thought I'd give it a go. So I've added the Bluetooth module to the back of the clock and that just pushed in the four pins that you soldered earlier. Uh, then what I've done is I've downloaded the APK file. I've managed to put it on my phone via the cloud. And it seems to be working. I'm going to point out this is a very cheap Android phone. It's a, I think it's a copy of a uh, Samsung phone. But it is just a cheap Android phone. Um, as you can see the program is running on here and we can tell it's working because you can do the same things do with the buttons on the back of the clock you can change the display you can see the temperature up here and you can show the date February the 16th um, when I first connected this via Bluetooth um, I put in the password 1234 and I then realized that the clock had adjusted itself to my phone time and date. 
so it would appear everything is working correctly on Bluetooth. I've also tried the alarm, uh, which is easy, you just set the alarm uh, to what time you want it, and then that will go off and you cancel the alarm by close ring or close alarm. So everything seems to work and was relatively painless to do. Thank you for watching.